Okay, great. If you're ready, we can go ahead and get started. I'll do the intro. Okay. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to Risk Management Back to Basics, presented today by Greg Jackson. My name is Rebecca, and I will be your session moderator. If you have questions for our presenter, please ask those using the Q&A box, which you will find on the right-hand side of your screen. And right above the Q&A box, you will also see there's a chat feature. So if you'd like to chat with other attendees, let the group know maybe which district you're from or simply want to say hello, please feel free to use the chat feature as well. And with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Greg. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. And Rebecca, can you see that okay? Yes, looks good. Okay. All right, well, welcome to the risk management uh, session on Back to Basics. My name is Greg Jackson. Um, I am with the Special Districts Risk Management Department. Um, hopefully you guys have found the conference to be information and helpful so far. Um, I know at least for me, I'm already looking forward to next year though, um, where we can actually be together and be in person. So we're gonna be doing uh, risk management back to basics today. So as we begin to try to get back to our, our new normal, if you will, uh, we thought we would go over some things that may have been forgotten about or ignored over the past year and a half or so. Also, uh, many of you may have been, uh, you may have hired new staff um, or you may be looking to hire new staff soon. So we also thought it'd be a good time to review these items because of those reasons. So I will say that we are gonna be covering a wide range of topics um, and we're only gonna be able to discuss probably the highlights of these items. Um, so if you have additional questions or any questions at all, um, please feel free to use the Q&A section um, on, the, on the platform, or we might even have some time at the end. Or if you need more in-depth conversations about any of these topics, just let us know and you can contact the risk management department uh, directly. So first, let's look at a couple of definitions. So let's define risk uh, and hazard. Um, I believe that by understanding these definitions, it will give us um, reasons and uh, uh, as to why we implement the policies and procedures that we do and gives us a better understanding. So the definition of risk um, is the chance or probability that a person will be harmed or experience an adverse health effect if exposed to a hazard. And then the definition of hazard is a potential source of harm or adverse health effect on a person or persons. So now that we've defined risk and, uh, and uh, hazard, we need to start to think about the tasks that our employees do on a daily basis. We need to think about the equipment that they are using and the amount of risk that you as a district are willing to take on, or in other words, our risk tolerance. Now, each district will have their own unique tasks and equipment, so more than likely, each district will probably have a different risk tolerance when it comes to those things. Now, when we talk about risk tolerance, it's how much risk the district is willing to accept. So for example, um, if you have confined spaces at your district and you are thinking about entering those, you might use the risk assessment uh, matrix on the right-hand side of that picture, and you will look, you'd look at the severity. So what is the severity of the type of injury you could have when it comes to confined space? Well, is it um, negligible, is it marginal, is it critical, or is it catastrophic? Then nextly, you're gonna look at the likelihood. How often would we be entering into a confined space? Is it frequent, probable, occasional, remote, or is it improbable? Well, for a lot of you out there, you know, the severity of entering into a confined space could either be critical or catastrophic. Uh, and we're probably going to enter into that confined space either occasionally or probably. So depending on where you fall in those, when you look at confined space directly, 
the risk matrix which say that this is either going to be a serious risk hazard or a high risk ha hazard, depending on how you rated severity and likelihood. So then let's look at something else. If we look at say mowing lawns, what is the severity and the likelihood of an injury when it comes to one of your employees mowing a lawn? Well, the severity could be anywhere from negligible to marginal, and it could be anywhere from frequent to occasional. So again, depending on how you rate that, will give you your risk assessment of that activity. And what you need to do is decide at that point, is that something we want to take on? So a good idea to, it is to use the risk matrix and the hierarchy of controls together to determine your next steps. So if we take that example of confined space, where it can be a serious or a high risk, then we look at the hierarchy of controls. Is this something that we could transfer? Is it something that we could eliminate? Is it something that we could mitigate? Or is it something that we're just gonna say, you know what, we're accepting that risk. And some of these decisions are gonna be influenced um, by the number of employees you have or the size of your district overall. So it's good for each of you to go through it, but the answers are not going to be universal from one district to another. And by looking at the tasks being performed by employees and, access, uh, and uh, assessing what your risk tolerance is, it'll give you a better idea of what tasks the district will do and what tax, tasks <laughs> sorry, you wanna transfer. So now that, um, next we're gonna be discussing safety committees and safety meetings. But first we're gonna attempt to take a quick poll regarding safety committees. So, um, Rebecca, can you bring up the poll question? Yes. Okay, so where are we seeing this question? <laughs> is it in the, is it just on the screen there? There we go, okay. So the question is, is how many employees does it take to require your district to have a safety committee? So choose an answer. Oh, there we go. Some people are responding. Okay. So more than five employees, more than 10 employees, more than eight employees, all districts must have a safety committee. And we'll give you a couple more seconds to chime in. Okay, well, it looks like we're at 100%, so that's good. So let's go ahead and, uh, I don't know, can you still see my slides or? There you go. I'll just share my screen. Okay, perfect. So, oh, of course that's not gonna work. There we go. Okay, so uh, it looked like a lot of you said that um, that all districts are required to have a safety committee, 62% of you, 38% of you said more than 10 employees. So for those of you that answered more than 10 employees, great job. If you did not answer that way, hey, you just learned something today. So who says you can't learn anything in these sessions? Now, for those of you that answered all districts are required to have a safety committee. I wanna make it clear that we are talking safety committees and safety meetings, and we are gonna discuss who needs what. So hopefully that will help, uh, help you understand better as to why not every district is required to have a safety committee. So let's discuss committees and meetings. Um, as risk management has been getting back out into the field and visiting with you guys, it appears that safety committees and safety meetings are one of the most frequent items that we're finding that have been set aside 
or just flat out been um, inconsistent. So let's look at who needs what. Well, we just answered that question in the poll as far as you are required to have a safety committee if you have 10 or more employees. Otherwise, you are required to have a safety meeting. Um, remember too that there, when, when OSHA says more than 10 employees, for example, that also includes volunteers. So you are required to have, um, if you have 10 or more or 10 or fewer employees and volunteers, then you have a safety um, meeting. Now, when we talk about members, then in a safety committee, you need to have typically a minimum of three people on your safety committee. Now, depending on the size of your district, three may be adequate, it may not be. However, um, Oregon OSHA did also put in a caveat that says not only do you need to have a minimum of three people, but you must have all major activities represented uh, on the committee as well. So if you think about uh, a district that has an office staff, they have a maintenance staff, they have a landscaping department, um, you know, they've got a transportation department, all, all of those major activities need to have somebody on the uh, committee as well. Now for safety meetings, there really is no set number as far as the number of people that need to be on the committee because technically if you're having a safety meeting, everybody is a, is a member. Now when it comes to safety committee meetings, remember those meetings must be held monthly, minutes must be taken, uh, taken and posted in conspicuous location um, so that everybody can see them. Um, this would, you are also required to post any documents that the safety committee discussed, um, would also include any um, inspection documents, and then any other items that you may have discussed during that uh, safety committee meeting. There's a question. Yes. Okay. Is it acceptable to have safety meetings bundled as an agenda item in a monthly general staff meeting? Um, yes and no. Uh, it kind of depends on if you are required to have a safety committee or if you are, are you, if you have, ten, um, you know, less than 10 employees to where you're having safety meetings. If you have more than 10 employees, I would not include my safety committee meeting um, during that same time. I would, I would try to separate those two things out. If you're doing a safety meeting, I would say that's, that's, um, that is okay. So I hope that answered that question. Um, so with meetings, with safety meetings, you need to hold them monthly. You are not required to take any minutes for those meetings unless you have uh, a single person or more who, are, who is going to miss the meeting. If anybody misses the meeting, then you are now required to take minutes and post them. Now, there is an exception Oregon OSHA put in there for safety meetings, is that if you are considered a utility, regardless of whether anybody is missing from the meeting or not, you have to take minutes and post them. And then during both safety committee and safety uh, meeting meetings, you should be addressing concerns from employees um, any recommendations that uh, have been made to management, uh, any hazards that have been identified during quarterly inspections. Um, and, and obviously there are a few other uh, examples of topics that could be addressed that I didn't uh, talk about here. Um, now for safety committee, uh, a safety committee, remember that there is a training requirement. Each committee member must be trained in hazard identification and accident investigation. Um, there are multiple ways that those committee members can receive that training. Um, you know, uh, SDIS has, uh, ha has a four part series on uh, safety committees that they could take those two sections and qualify. You can have the risk management department come out and do an in-person training. Um, Oregon OSHA has some training material on their website as well. And then you also have safe personnel as another option that you could take to get those uh, training requirements for your committee members. Now on inspections, for safety committees, uh, inspections, all locations must be done in a quarter. So if you have five different uh, um, buildings within your district, 
all five of those locations must have an inspection done on a quarterly basis. Now that does not mean that you have to do all five of those buildings in the same day, um, but it just must be done in that same quarter. And then also remember too that those um, uh, quarterly inspections, they can take place of your uh, monthly meeting. Now safety meetings are not required to conduct quarterly inspections. Um, when it comes to effectiveness, safety committees need to review their effectiveness annually. Um, this is basically going to be a review of what has been accomplished, what is still outstanding, and what goals do you have for the upcoming year? If you are a safety meeting, you are not required to do um, an effectiveness uh, evaluation, if you will. Um, however, it's not a bad idea to still do that to try to figure out how things are going. And the last thing on this I would wanna say is that remember that safety committees are important, um, but they only work when the committee views it as, an, as important rather than something required by Oregon OSHA. The committee will only be successful if they take it seriously and if they believe they have support from management as well. So now let's transition into uh, inspections. So documented quarterly inspections need to be conducted by the safety committee at a minimum. Um, even though safety meetings are not required, to conduct a quarterly inspection, safety inspections should still be done by the district. This can be done by staff just paying attention to their surroundings um, and doing visual inspections, uh, making sure to report any concerns that they may see or have uh, to management. Now in the next few slides, um, we're gonna look at some different hazards that the risk management department sees that may or may not be addressed during your inspections, but are still important for the overall safety of the district and your employees. So for example, when we're inspecting shops, here are just a few things. Um, housekeeping is one of the ones that, it, you know, is always something that I typically see when I go out to a member. It's just some simple housekeeping, making sure that we have aisles uh, for people to walk through. Um, cords on the ground are not uncommon as well. These become tripping hazards, so we'd wanna have those picked up. Um, the upper right-hand corner, like the table saw, for example, making sure that your power equipment has all of the necessary guards. Remember that if I was an Oregon OSHA inspector and I came out and I saw that table saw, that is just a really easy citation for me to give to you because you don't have push sticks, you don't have uh, the proper guards in place. So it's just really easy to see. Um, another thing is um, secondary containers. So if you guys have chemicals and you're using secondary containers, make sure that those are labeled with the contents. Um, that, again, that's a simple one to look at. Um, also, if your shops have um, eyewash bottles, how many of you knew that eyewash bottles actually have an expiration date? So that you need to be looking at that to make sure that they haven't expired. Also, if you have an eyewash uh, bottle, for example, if somebody actually used the eyewash bottle and only used half of the bottle, it's actually a violation to put it back on the shelf there and use it again. Eyewash bottles are typically one-time use. You either use the whole bottle or you don't use it at all. If it's been used at all, you need to replace it with a new one. And then another thing could just be backup generators, for example, just making sure that you're doing inspections of those that they're, that they're uh, fueled up, that you've tested them to make sure that they're running properly. When it comes to inspecting your property, um, make sure you're looking at your roofs. Uh, we still get a lot of claims from uh, roof leaks. Um, this also goes along with checking your gutters and your downspouts. You wanna make sure that those are good, in good condition and that the water when it's going through the downspout is uh, being moved away from the building. You don't want just a downspout where there, it doesn't lead anywhere except for against your foundation. It's gonna lead to problems in the future, so make sure all the water is being pushed away. Uh, look at your siding to make sure that uh, you know it's not peeling, like in this case, that's just gonna lead to dry rot or, or even possibly some uh, mold and mildew if, if we don't address it. One of the big things to look at is your outside lighting. 
Make sure that your outside lighting is functional and working. Um, we get quite a few claims, especially during the winter time and fall time because it gets darker a lot sooner, that outside lighting around the district isn't working, it's not timed right, um, or it's just burned out. So make sure you're checking all of your outside lighting. And finally, like with property, um, you know, look at the vegetation around your uh, buildings. Make sure that you don't have trees that are over, uh, overhanging limbs over your roof. Um, that's just going to cause havoc on your roof. Um, also, it's going to clutter up your gutters. Um, consider SEPTED when you're, when you're doing this as well. SEPTED stands for Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design. So it's basically talking about, for example, limbing up trees to a certain height, um, trimming bushes around the building to keep them small so that they don't create hiding spots. Uh, you want to be able to have clear lines of sight. So just a few things to think about when you're inspecting your property. There was a question. Yes. Uh, do board members count as number of district volunteers? No, they do not. Um, as a, if they, well, let's put it this way. If a board member is acting as a board, as a board member, they are not considered an employee or volunteer of the district. Now, however, on, uh, if that board member then also volunteers for the district as a volunteer, not acting as a board member, then you would end up counting, uh, counting them as a volunteer. Um, so don't, it, it sounds like the same answer, but it's not. It, it really, you have to define what role are they playing um, at that time. If, it, if they're acting as a board member, they don't count. If they're acting as just a, normal um, patron of the district and they're volunteering their time, then probably they are going to be counted for that. Any others? Nope, that was it. Okay. Um, so if you are a, a, a district that has a playground, um, some of the things quickly to think about and look at is graffiti. If you have any graffiti on your playgrounds, you need to make sure that you're notifying your maintenance department to get them to clean it up right away. Um, remember, you know, I think it's called the broken window so syndrome. Same thing with graffiti. If we don't clean it up, then it lets all of the taggers know that, hey, we can come mark this area. Um, swing seats are usually a big one um, because of the type of weather that we have. You're going to want to make sure you're checking your swing seats to make sure they're not cracked or broken like the one you see. Um, arson is another big thing for, for playgrounds, whether that be your surfacing material or the actual play equipment itself. Um, make sure that you're looking and noticing any um, attempts at arson against your playgrounds. And then also make sure that you are communicating that to the proper authorities um, if, if you did notice something. Another thing to look at is your surfacing material. Make sure that you are following the CPSC guidelines as far as the depth uh, um, or the type, depending on what you're using, whether it's the uh, wood chips, the pea gravel, or, or anything else. Um, and then also um, that lower right-hand picture of the bench and the concrete footing um, that's been, um, that you can actually see now. There's two things there. Number one, um, I call that the cheese grater because if that's on the playground near a piece of equipment and a kid falls down and cuts themselves on that, it's gonna look like their, their legs went through a cheese grater. So you wanna make sure that all of those are covered. But the second thing that should tell you right away is that if you're seeing the concrete footing, you definitely do not have enough surfacing material on your playground. So make sure you get more. The other thing that you can be looking at too are nuts and bolts, making sure that everything is tight and not coming loose. Just some uh, simple liability things to look at when you're doing inspections are, are your sidewalks. Um, sidewalks sometimes get pushed off, tried to get pushed off to the city. The city says, no, it's yours. So just be aware of the, the sidewalk conditions around you. Remember that it only takes about an inch difference in elevation for somebody to trip over. So make sure that you're noting those or you have a plan to fix them if, if your sidewalks um, have an issue. Uh, your parking lots are another thing to consider. Um, this is not obviously a very uh, good example of a, of a good conditioned uh, parking lot because of all the broken bullards. Um, you know, these can be, I've seen these uh, actually become uh, projectiles to throw through uh, windows that are at our members. 
I've seen people trip over these. Um, I've also um, seen that uh, vehicles damaged by these. So make sure that your parking lots are in good condition and cleaned up. The lower left picture um, of that little um, wire gate, if you will, um, the wire roping, um, these, <laughs> believe it or not, these actually cause a lot of problems. Um, we've actually had people on bikes not see them and hit them. We've had people walk into them and get hurt. We've had cars try to drive through them. So you want to make sure that if you have something like this, that you are making sure that that is as visible as possible. Uh, maybe it's, you know, putting a piece of PVC, painted PVC pipe on it. Um, I've had a couple of districts use like green garden hoses um, to put over to make it stand out. You can use um, construction tape as a temporary use to try to make make it seem better, but just try to make sure that people can see it um, better at night, especially, for example. Um, if you have trails or if you have fields or anything that where people would be walking around in your district, you know, you really should just be walking those every, uh, those every once in a while. Obviously, you can't control every hole that you might have in the ground, but you do want to see, you know, make sure that you find the ones that are um, open and obvious, for example. And then emergency lighting inside your buildings as well. Make sure that, you know, that if you have emergency lighting or lighted exit signs, that all of those are working properly. And you, there is, remember, there's a button on the emergency lights that you can push to test the lights to make sure that the bulbs aren't burnt out. And then um, when you're looking at your office, um, you know, especially right now or, or the past few months anyway, people have probably started using portable heaters. So if you're using those or allowing staff to use those, make sure that those portable heaters um, are equipped with the automatic shutoff if they get tipped over. Try not to have them uh, near any flammable material as well. Um, the lower left photo there, the uh, electrical cords, um, it's still not uncommon for us to see something like that, but please remember if you're using an extension cord for anything, that should be temporary use only. Um, don't piggyback one surge protector into another uh, because this could overload your circuits and create an electrical uh, hazard. So just be on the lookout for um, overloading uh, and electrical uh, circuits and stuff. So the next thing is your fire extinguishers. So most of you probably have fire extinguishers at your facilities. You probably have a third party come in and they're gonna go ahead and do their uh, inspection annually, which is great. But remember, Oregon OSHA requires that you conduct a monthly inspection of your fire extinguishers as well. That tag, that a a I or AEGIS tag, actually has a place for you to put the date and the uh, and initials of who inspected that. Now, what are you inspecting? Basically just making sure that the needle is in the green zone, saying that that unit is charged, that the hose is in good condition, there's no cracks or anything like that. Um, if you have AEDs, which a lot of you have AED machines now, there's two things I'd really like to remind you about to look at there. One is gonna make sure that the battery is still working and two, that your pads have not expired. Yep, those expire as well. So you wanna make sure that you have a replacement program for your uh, AED pads. One thing I forgot to mention on the fire extinguishers is a lot of districts have a lot of fire extinguishers. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's not a bad idea to create an Excel spreadsheet of each location of your fire extinguishers, including if you have any in your vehicles. So that way you didn't miss any when you were doing your inspection. So for those of you that are just getting started, um, aren't quite sure what to look for, uh, here are two examples of checklists that we, um, that we have at the Risk Management Department and can send to you uh, if you'd like us to. Um, the nice thing about these is they're in a Word format, so you can make modifications to the form to fit your specific needs. The one thing I would say is be cautious though when using a checklist that you don't get tunnel vision by just looking at the items on the checklist. Um, you know, you can start out to use them until you start to get familiar with things, but don't use them every single time, just because I don't want you looking at the exact same things every single time. You should be noticing other things as well. All right, moving right along here, um, we're going to switch gears into some of the more basic safety programs um, that may be required. 
So I'm only going to be touching on some of the highlights of these programs. So if you are wanting or needing more in-depth information about them, then please ask our department and uh, we can get back to you with more information. So the first thing is, uh, let's talk about hazard communication. So if you have chemicals at your facility, um, and, and then, oh, let's see, let me rephrase that. If you have chemicals at your building, you're probably going to need to have a hazard communication program. Now, if you have less than household quantity of, say, motor oil, then you're probably not going to need to have a hazard communication prob, uh, program. So really, I want you to think about this from the standpoint of household quantity, probably don't need a program. Any chemical that you have more than household quantity, you're probably going to need to have a program. Now, if you have any, say, say you have hydrochloric acid for some reason, you're going to need to have a pro uh, program be, no matter how much you have. So it really kind of depends on what you have and how much you have as to whether or not you will need this. Now, if you do, you need to have a written program. You need to provide uh, training to all staff. You need to have your safety data sheets available. Um, and then you need to train staff on how to read a safety data sheet. Um, you should have a person designated to be in charge of the chemicals and the labeling of any secondary containers. One other thing I'm gonna throw in on that one is that any time that you introduce a new chemical uh, to the district, then that's when you would be required to do a retraining of just that chemical. Now, for those of you who have your own maintenance departments, do your own uh, repair work, more than likely you would have to have a lockout tagout program. Now, this is a little bit more complex, but if you are doing repairs, then you would need to have a written program you need to have a training program. You need to have outlined procedures as to lock out or tag out each uh, type of equipment that you are, are gonna be repairing. And then the biggest one that always gets missed with this one is you need to conduct an annual inspection of someone using those outlined procedures. So it's basically a review to make sure that the individual doing the lockout tag out is uh, following the procedures that you outlined as a district within your policy. Now, confined space. Remember that if you have confined spaces, which is it's large enough to enter, not designed for continuous occupancy, and has limited access or egress, then you have a confined space. And then you have to determine, well, do we have permit confined space? So a permit requirements have all of those things I just said, Plus, you would have one or more of the hazards like either engulfment, configuration, atmospheric, or any other recognized hazard. So basically, if you are entering into confined spaces, then the highlights are going to be you have to have a written program. Um, you have to conduct training for your entrant and your attendant. You need to have a rescue plan, and you have to practice that rescue uh, plan annually. Um, you have to have monitoring equipment. Um, more than likely, if you want to try to enter in under alternate procedures, you would need to have ventilation systems, and you need to make sure that any confined space is labeled. Um, you may also need to conduct training, an awareness training, for employees that work near a confined space, but may never enter into one. So confined space has a, is a very complex uh, written program. Again, if you decided that this is something you guys need uh, additional assistance with, then let us know and we can help walk you through. And we do, one thing I didn't mention is we do have sample plans for each one of the safety programs that I'm talking about today. So if you need a sample plan, you can always reach out and ask us for, um, for the sample. Um, okay, respirators. So, Respirators can be confusing as far as do I need a program? Do I need, not need a program? Do I need it for wild, wildland fire smoke now? Do I not need it? Well, let's just, we're going to keep this one very simple and just say that respirators, number one, determine if they're needed. If they are, then you need to have a written plan. You need to provide training. You need to do medical evaluations 
and you would need to do fit testing for employees that are required to wear them. I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, again, because this one can get complicated, if you have additional questions, we can talk about it later. Um, the next thing I want to talk about are job hazard analysis. So JHAs. So these are often skipped, um, but are important. It's an important analysis um, of each job task that your district does, because it can provide you with information about the dangers of the task and how the district can best uh, protect your employees from injuries. Um, it also helps determine the appropriate type of personal protective equipment needed and will assist you in thinking about any engineering or administrative controls uh, that could be put in place to help protect um, your staff. And then one tip that I would say is because technically you should be doing a JHA for every task that your district does. Now you're gonna look at me and go, whoa, wait a minute, we do a thousand different tasks. How am I gonna do that in, uh, um, you know, take the time to do that for every single one of those? Well, one of the things that I try to recommend, and it doesn't always work, but it, sometimes it can, is try to combine jobs if possible. So for example, if I'm doing a, um, if I'm doing a JHA, and I know that I'm gonna to have to do one for mowing lawns, leaf blowing, and weed eating, weed eating for example, um, then you know what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go, I'm gonna title that JHA landscaping. Landscaping includes lawn mowing, weed eating, and leaf blowing. And then I'm going to basically go through that JHA and look at the hazards and say, here are the types of hazards that could, be, that could harm you. Here are, here's the personal protective equipment that we're, we are going to require you to wear while doing one of those jobs. It will not work for everything, but that might be one way to help limit the amount that you uh, need to be doing. Now, the next question. program is uh, bloodborne pathogens. There's a question. Um, bloodborne pathogens. Number one, determine if uh, you have employees that have a reasonable exposure uh, to bloodborne pathogens. Now, if you're a custodian and your job is to clean the restrooms, you have a reasonable exposure. If you are um, a secretary um, that works in the front office, I would probably say that you don't have a reasonable exposure. So first you need to determine who has that reasonable exposure. Then you need to have a written plan you need to offer the HEP uh, B vaccination um, or have an employee sign a declination page if they say, no, thank you, I don't want it. But then even if they decline it, you need to also understand that that individual can change their mind at any time and come back and say, I'd like to have that series of shots now. You need to provide annual training. This is one of those, one, uh, one of those safety programs that does require annual training. Um, you should also be providing the appropriate personal protective equipment and any um, disposal, disposal methods or sharps containers you may also need to have. Okay, before we go to the next one, we're going uh, to try another poll question. There is a, a question first. About oh, sure. Yep, go ahead. How are other districts completing their fit testing on required N95 masks? Uh, it's a great question. Um, to be quite honest with you, I don't know. I have not um, been able to uh, speak to members about that as of right now. Um, I do know that there are a few ways that you could do it. One, you could always check with your local fire department to see what they would recommend or if they can do some fit testing for you. Also, um, they have banana smoke available that you can, um, you can purchase packets of banana smoke. And what basically what you do is you put your N95 on, you crack this little thing with banana smoke, you run it around their face. If they can smell it, you know they don't have a good fit. If they can't smell it, you know the fit is good. Not saying that's the best way to do it, um, but, um, but the, those are some of the ways that I know some have done it in the past. Unfortunately, I don't have a great answer for you uh, because I have not heard how members are doing it exactly. Sorry about that. Any others coming up? Uh, no, that was it so far. Okay, so can we go to the second poll question? Okay, so this poll question is going to ask, um, when are you required to have a hearing conservation program? Eight hour time weighted average of 90 or higher, eight hour time weighted average of 75 or higher, 
eight hour time weighted average of 85 or higher or an eight hour time weighted average of 80 or higher. We'll give you a few seconds to go ahead and uh, click your answer. Or maybe everybody left and there's nobody left in the session. Not, not as much. There oh, you go. Here we go. All right, look good. Looks like we're getting some responses in now. Okay, we'll take just another second or two. So get your answers in. Okay, so as of right now, it looks like um, the leader right now in when are you required to have a hearing conservation program? Oh, it just tied. Uh, the leaders are eight hour time weighted average of 75 or higher or eight hour time weighted average of 80 or higher. Those two are in the lead right now, followed by 90. And coming in last place is uh, a, an eight hour time weighted average of 85 or higher. Okay, go ahead and close the poll. So when I closed the poll, it showed that 31% of you thought that it would be a time weighted average of 80 or higher. Um, and 31% of you also thought that it was going to be um, a time weighted average of 70 or higher. The answer is that employers must have an effective hearing conservation program whenever employee noise exposures equal or exceed an eight hour time weighted average of 85 decibels and higher. So those of you who actually chose C, great job. For the rest of you, Hey, we learned something new again. Awesome. So hearing conservation. So the first thing, if you are wondering if you need to have a hearing conservation program, there's a few things that you want to do first. Number one, you want to go, wow, I wonder how loud our equipment is. Do we need to have one of these? So what you're going to do is you're going to conduct some noise sampling. Go and uh, uh, have the noise sampled of whatever equipment you think is loud or is too loud. Now, you might also be asking, well, how can I get that done? Do I have to buy equipment? No, technically the easiest, you just call risk management, contact us and we'll come out and we'll do some noise sampling for you. We have the equipment to do it. And then from there, depending on what that noise comes back as, you may want to then conduct what they call dosimeter testing. The dosimeter testing is going to give you the time weighted out average over eight hours for that particular employee in what they do on a typical day. Now, again, you might be asking, hey, how do we get that done? Well, again, you just contact the risk management department. We also have that equipment. We can come out and do the dosimeter testing for you as well. Now, if it's determined that you do need to have a hearing conservation program, then you need to have a written plan you will need to provide audiometric testing. You will need to um, also provide training to staff. And then you will also um, need to have any record keeping if there are any shifts in an employee's hearing um, once they've had the audio, um, after each year of the audiometric testing. So there are some complex, those are complex, oh, complexity, no, that's not right, sorry. It's a complex, safety program. So again, if you have additional questions on that plan, uh, get a hold of us and we can help you out. 
Now, the, the last two safety programs that I want to go over are safety uh, or um, wildfire smoke and heat illness. Wildfire smoke, for example, this was uh, spoke of on Thursday, if you were able to go to the pre-session. Um, but wildfire smoke is going to be similar to the temporary rule. So you need to be familiar with the action levels, basically, that are going to be at 101, 251, and 501. Each level requires something different, whether that's providing an N95 mask, um, or it can be voluntary use, or you don't have to do anything. It just kind of depends. But you will need to be, uh, you will be required to provide an N95 mask for employees possibly, and you will be required to conduct training for employees when it comes to wildfire smoke. Now, heat illness, from what I understand, that rule is making some major changes. Um, so you need to know the action levels that include the relative humidity um, you need to provide shade, you need to provide water, you will need to have a written plan, you will need to provide training to staff, um, and you will need to determine what kind of um, acclimatization um, you're going to have and how you're going to go about that. So there's a lot of complexities into the heat illness rule. Um, so make sure that you are familiar because that one's probably going to affect every district in the state. Now, I will say that if you did not attend the uh, pre-conference session on smoke and heat on Thursday, I highly recommend that you watch this session. Uh, my coworker Troy D. Young did a great job explaining these requirements. Um, and this rule is most likely going to become permanent probably sometime in March or April. Um, so if you do need further in, uh, information on either one of these new rules, then please contact Troy or myself and we can try to help you out. So supervision, uh, let's transition to the importance of that. Um, again, as you all start to hire new employees, supervision of these employees are gonna be even that much more critical. So supervisors, supervisors should be engaging with employees on a regular basis. Um, try to get out in the field or out in the shops. It will give you a better understanding of what's going on. Set up some times to meet with um, employees, either individually or during staff meetings. Again, just to kind of see how things are going. The more, remember that uh, the more employees feel management understands what's going on and is willing to listen to what you have to say as an employee, the more likely they are to believe in the district's safety policies and practices. One of the big things that we have an opportunity to do that I think we miss sometimes is teaching expectations. So as you, especially if you are getting new employees now, this is a great time to teach expectations. It's one of the hardest things to take time for, but if we don't do it, employees will make their own rules and not understand why they're being disciplined, which can lead to resentment or alienation. So most of these expectations, um, will be covered by your policies, but it is always good, uh, a good idea to explain them. The best uh, thing supervisors can do is to lead by example. <clears throat> There's a question, I think it's from an earlier slide. Um, okay. They said, how is reasonable defined? How is reasonable defined? So we're talking about um, I'm assuming that's talking about bloodborne pathogen and having a reasonable exposure. So realistically, what it, what it, um, the way I've understood the reasonable to be defined is if you have a job that gives you that reasonable expectation. So if I'm a firefighter, if I'm an EMT, I have a reasonable, um, um, what am I trying to say? Um, I have a, a reasonable possibility of getting or, or having or being exposed to bloodborne pathogens, right? And um, if I work at a sanitary district, I have a reasonable um, expectation. What is it? Uh, sorry, I'm completely spacing that one. Reasonable exposure. Sorry. I have a reasonable exposure to bloodborne pathogens if I'm working in a sanitary district, unless. I'm office staff. If I'm office staff, I don't have that reasonable, expect, um, reasonable exposure. 
If I'm a janitor or if I do custodial work, which includes cleaning restrooms, you could say that you have a reasonable exposure to that. Now, let's say that I work at a water district. It's potable water. Um, would you say that you have a reasonable exposure to bloodborne pathogens? I would say no, because you're not doing anything unless you're doing, say, the custodial work, which includes cleaning restrooms. A reasonable expo exposure, I'll explain it this way, is also not something where I can just assume that my coworker is going to get cut and I'm going to assist them. If, if that's what you're trying to determine is reasonable, it's not. You don't have a reasonable exposure just because your, your um, coworker uh, could be cut you know, by a knife or something. So reasonable exposure really is, what, am I, what is my reasonable exposure to bloodborne pathogens? Firefighters, EMTs, um, you know, ambulance, um, sanitary districts, custodial work, those are all things that I would consider reasonable exposure. Hope that answers that question. There's one more. Uh-huh. Uh, it says, uh, lands, I think it's landscape employees that find needles in the park. Um, okay, landscapes, okay. Landscaping who find needles, um, my thought on that is that they do not have a reasonable exposure. It's, it's like something that we just found this. That's, but my job is, unless my job is to go around the park and look for needles specifically, then I would have a reasonable exposure. If I'm a landscaper and I happen to come across one, I would not call that reasonable exposure. However, I would take the time to provide training in what is expected of how to deal with that situation and where to find you know, the best place on, on how to dispose of the needle. But I don't necessarily think that a landscaper would say have a reasonable exposure to bloodborne pathogen. Um, so getting back to teaching expectations, uh, again, most of these um, expectations will be covered in your policies, but it's always a good idea to explain them. Uh, the best thing supervisors can do is to lead by example, and it, you know, because if you take a shortcut, then your employees will think that it's also okay for them to take a shortcut. It's also very important to hold employees accountable if they're doing something wrong. So your district has set expectations. Now you have policies and procedures also, and if those get broken, then, then we need to hold people accountable. If we let the small things slide, it's gonna lead to bigger issues down the road. It is so important to be consistent and fair when it comes to um, holding employees accountable. If you give an inch, some are gonna try to take a mile, or you uh, could also be seen as playing favorites. So again, as some of you are starting to get ready uh, possibly to um, hire new employees, you know, on the job training um, can go a long way with setting expectations. This is an opportunity you don't wanna take lightly or dismiss. So show employees the process of what they're gonna be doing. Then I want the supervisor to demonstrate it. Then have the employee explain the process and then have them do it. Provide tests for tasks to show that they really understand how to do it. Document the training and conduct periodic inspections of them doing the task to ensure that they understand it. If the employee misses a step or does it wrong, be patient, but start the process over again. Now look, I totally get that that process sounds very time consuming um, and you know we don't have a lot of manpower, we don't have a lot of time, we've got a lot of things to do. But we need to do this. And it, um, it, the, the, the uh, consuming portion or the, the amount of time it takes, um, remember that's gonna also depend on the difficulty of the task. So this, by doing this though, it's gonna help to make sure that the employee knows how to do the job safely and that the supervisors have set clear expectations of how they expect the job to be done. So that goes back to that teaching expectations. And trust me when I say that taking time in the beginning is going to save you time and money in the end. 
A um, couple other tips here. When you have a question, would you rather have the answer of because I said so, or would you rather have the answer explained? Taking a little bit of time to explain a policy or practice will help get buy-in from the employees. This may also help open lines of communication. And depending on your approach, it can either bring the district together or start to lead to animosity. Try to communicate to staff as much as possible. Keep them up to date with what's going on with the district and what's on the horizon. Get input on projects or just check in to see how things are going. And as we discussed before, make sure you're holding employees accountable. And since I've said this a couple of different times, please understand that that's how important it is. Remember to be consistent and fair. And empower your employees. Let them have a voice by asking for opinions and, out, and, and input. Support your safety committees and provide growth opportunities or increased responsibility for those that deserve it. Try to be available for your employees as well. Make sure that they know that your door is always open. Um, make sure that they feel heard. Um, because if they do, then they're more likely to come talk to you. And this is a great thing. Uh, and it's also a great time to get a feel for how things are going, not only within the district, but also out in the field, how projects are going and, and progressing or any concerns that other people may have. Uh, sorry. Um, so, okay. So now we're going to just briefly highlight incident and accident investigations. Do you know what to do and when? So simply put, what's the difference between an incident and an accident? Uh, well, an incident or near miss um, is when, a, when there's no medical attention needed and an accident requires medical attention. Quickest, easiest way to define the difference. It's important that you document both. The last thing you wanna do is have to question um, one of your injured employees as to whether or not it occur, occurred at work or off the job. So both incidents and accidents need to be investigated. Without the investigations, you won't be able to prevent it from happening again. So who's gonna do them? Well, it's kind of up to you. So this could be a supervisor. It could be your safety committee. It could be even that you have a designated team. The district needs to identify who's going to do the investigations and make sure those in, uh, individuals um, are gonna have whatever training and resources necessary to complete the job. Also, know the difference between the incident and accident forms, the 801 form, and when to use what. So on this slide, on the left-hand side, you've got an incident report. The incident accident form needs to be filled out regardless so that the investigation can happen. This form will allow the district to identify surface causes and root causes which can lead to potential uh, recommendations for improvement. If you have a safety committee, they should also be reviewing these forms, whether they did the investigation or not, looking to see if they can make any recommendations uh, for improvement as well. And on the right-hand side, you've got your 801 form. This should be used when medical treatment is required. This form only asks for what happened. It, does, it is not an investigation form. So please remember that the 801 also is a legal document and should, uh, should not be used for any incidents, just your accidents if medical, um, medical attention is required. So let's real quickly try an, one more poll question real quick. Rebecca, are you bringing that one up? Okay, last poll question. When are you required to post the Oregon OSHA 300A summary? January 1st to December 31st, June 1st to August 30th, April 1st to July 31st, February 1st to April 30th. Come on, results. There we go. We've got four people who have answered so far and they all chose a different answer. I love it. Here we go, here we go. Now we're getting some more.
Okay, January 1st to December 31st is in the lead, followed by February 1st to April 30th. Hurry and get your answers in. In five, four, three, two, one. All right, let's go ahead and end the poll. So the winner was at 43% of you think that January 1st to December 31st is when you're required um, to post your OSHA 300 form. Now I will say the close second was um, February 1st to April 30th. For those of you who answered February 1st to April 30th, you are correct. Your OSHA 300A summary needs to be posted during February 1st to April 30th. Now districts should be setting the expectation that any employee injury needs to be communicated immediately regardless of severity. We just need to set that expectation. Now, please remember that Oregon OSHA has a couple of reporting requirements as well. You must report within eight hours if you have a work-related fatality or catastrophe, and you must report within 24 hours if you have an employee um, who has any type of hospitalization, overnight hospitalization, amputation, avulsion, or loss of an eye. Now, if the district has a claim, whether it's a liability claim, a property claim, or even a workers' comp claim, you need to report to your agent and or SDIS uh, claims adjusters ASAP. Please understand that the adjusters will be able to help you better the sooner they know about the incident or the accident. And same thing with you. Make sure to set the expectation that regardless of the incident or accident, it needs to be reported. And then finally, make sure to fill out your 300 log um, as required and post your 300 day summary from February 1st to April 30th. Now, here's a quick example of the 300 log. Um, please note that this form can be downloaded on OROSHA's website if you need one. But just wanted to give you an idea of what the 300 form looks like. Here's an example of the OSHA 300 a summary. Um, and you can also find this on the OSHA website. Please note that this uh, form asks for the company executive or highest ranking manager to sign it. Now, unfortunately, we did have one district cited for having the secretary sign it. I don't agree with it, um, but please just take note that the actual form itself does say company executive or highest ranking manager is the one who is supposed to sign the summary. We do have a question. Okay, go ahead. What types of incidents, accidents, do you recommend we do reports on for patrons? Um, honestly, I would probably do one, well, I'm going to do something, or I would say anytime you have somebody who says that they trip and fell, um, somebody who got injured, you know, on the playground, if they report it to you, for example, um, if they tripped over something, I, you know, if someone come, comes to you and says, hey, I cut myself, you know, you know, honestly, I'd probably do one for that too. Um, I see the patrons pretty much the same. You wanna have documentation that something happened. Um, so anytime you get a report from a patron that something happened, you should be documenting that. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so first off, let me apologize for death by PowerPoint today. But now while I believe that training is important, I'm not so sure that you need to go to that length that Dwight did to get his point across. Um, but I do understand that when it comes to training, there's a lot to go through and it can take a lot of time. So remember that training is a marathon, not a sprint. You don't have to do all of your training in one day or one week, spread it out um, so that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't feel like you're constantly training. Now, how often do you have to train staff? Well, that'll uh, vary on the type of district that you are what policies you have, and what type of equipment your district uses. Remember that you have, if you have a bloodborne pathogen policy, for example, you're gonna have to um, provide annual training for that policy. 
Um, you should be doing initial training for any equipment that employees are using. And then retraining should be occurring when or if you get any new equipment or an accident has occurred. Now, if you have questions regarding training for staff, uh, just contact us and, and we can help discuss it with you. Now, one thing when it comes to training to keep in mind is that, you know, people learn in different ways. Some may be visual learners, some may be auditory learners, um, while others learn, uh, they learn best by doing it hands-on. So you should try to understand this and adapt your training styles to help fit those needs. Now, when it comes to training, it also helps to mix it up. So you are not always watching the same webinar over and over every year for bloodborne pathogens, for example, or listening to the same person over and over. Remember that special districts offers three different types of trainings to help, the, to help you with this. So, you know, the risk management department can do in-person training. Uh, the district has access to the safe personnel online training. And over the past two years, we've developed many 30 minute webinars that you can also utilize. I would encourage each, each of you um, to make sure that you are taking advantage of these options and then also exploring others. Um, you might even you know, consider asking uh, different manufacturers of your equipment or even checking with your agents to see if there are some uh, trainings that they could provide for you. And lastly, I wanna remind you about the different resources that you have available to you. Um, so for example, you know, if you're familiar with the SDAO website, um, you know, this is where you're gonna find all of our quick reference guides. So we have a ton of those available for you. The sample checklist that I shared in the presentation for you, we have those on our website as well. Um, you have access to the resource library, which has been greatly improved and makes it a lot easier to find things. And then again, you have the in-person online or, or webinar style trainings that are available to you. Um, one other thing that I wanted to let you know about is that we are looking to add a uh, web page um, on the SDAO website for weather alerts as well. Um, hopefully in the last uh, few months, you were able to um, receive some of those alerts that we sent out saying, hey, weather event near you. Well, we're actually gonna be hoping to get a, um, a web page on our uh, website um, where you can go to get, gain that access. Um, and then finally, as a, just kind of an idea, this is what the resource library on the website looks like. Um, this is how you can utilize it. Um, I typed in a quick, um, I typed in quick reference guides in the search uh, field, and here's what popped up. So again, the reference library has been improved, uh, makes it easier to find what you're looking for. So make sure that you give it a try. If you're looking for webinars, you can also type in just webinar and it'll bring up every one that we have. So, you know, I appreciate everyone taking the time to attend our session on Back to Basics. Um, I hope you were able to find the session informational and helpful. Um, Rebecca, do we have any additional questions? There was a question that came in, I think, before the video clip. Um, and okay. it, says, uh, it says, posted where? Office board website or submitted somewhere? <clears throat> okay, so that question, um, I'm going to assume was on the OSHA 300A summary. Um, the OSHA 300 summary needs to be posted in a conspicuous location for everybody to see. My recommendation would be you post it in an area that is next to you know, the area that you have all of your uh, federal and state postings up. I would post it right in that at same area. That was the last one I had. That was the last one. Okay, well, we'll give it a couple more minutes because I know there is a lag time. So if you guys are uh, wanting to type in some more questions, uh, please feel free to do that. Um, gosh, I guess I did. And well, I guess we're about 15 minutes um, early, which isn't too bad. So I, that, that went better than I thought. Um, oh, but, we do have one. Awesome. Okay, next. What are we are members of the board of directors eligible for being on the safety committee? Are they eligible to being on the safety committee? Um, <laughs> there, well, a, a board member can be on the safety committee. However, I would invite them in as a guest, but not a, don't, 
I wouldn't have them as a committee member. And that's, I only simply say that um, because there's a difference between a board member and say a district manager. Um, they have different job duties and functions. Um, they can certainly attend your meetings as a guest, um, but I would not um, have them on as a committee member. Any other questions? I don't see any yet, but we can give it a minute if you okay. want. Sure. Hopefully you were all able to see uh, the training video. I really liked that one when I found it. So I thought it was pretty funny. Doesn't look like there's any more coming in. Okay. Well, again, everybody, I really appreciate you guys attending the uh, Back to Basics um, session for the, uh, the conference today and taking the time. I know it's beautiful outside, so I really appreciate you guys listening in. Um, if anything does come up, you know, after the session is over, uh, again, please feel free to reach out to the Risk Management Department. You can reach us at Risk Management at sdao.com and uh, we can go from there. Other than that, I hope you guys have a great rest of the day. Um, don't forget, we've got the business meeting and the awards uh, ceremonies coming up tonight. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to see everybody there. Thanks again. All right, thank you everyone. And yes, thank you, Greg. Thanks everyone for being here. Uh, just a reminder, please fill out the session evaluation before you head to your next training and we look forward to